No, he is there. He lives there. They depend on the polluted water. He's gone there to fetch, because we're talking about evidence-based issues. So that for the minister, I don't know who gave him the briefing that Ancobra is becoming clean now. The people, they, they have just showed it to you that we cannot win this fight against illegal mining with, with lip service and, and hypocrisy. No, it has to be something real on the ground. So that's the chief. But you see, aside the issues we're dealing with, water pollution, which is now causing Ghana Water Company to spend so much to purify our water bodies so we can get clean water to drink. We're also faced with air pollution. So there's pollution everywhere. Water pollution. We have other forms of pollution. Now the air visual, a real time, this is real time air quality information platform is saying that Ghana's air quality is currently 49.6 times more than the WHO annual air quality guide value. Now, this is the site. It is iqair.com. Please, you can check it yourself. They attribute the high concentration of pollution in Accra atmosphere to human activity. Right? Take a look at this. Okay, let me expand it for you. Ghana is there, number five. As of yesterday, they had classified our atmosphere as hazardous. The hazardous meaning that we were 300, over 301 and more. What's happened now? Because it is real time, Ghana has dropped to the sixth position now in terms of the rankings on, on unhealthy environment or the air pollution. 171. And now take a look at this. The color bars at the top represent the classification. So 171 is classified now as unhealthy. So we have moved from hazardous to unhealthy. Obviously, that's the, it explains itself. It's unhealthy. What we are breathing in is unhealthy air. And we are far away from good. We are inhaling particles from the air, including dust, soot, dead smoke, and liquid droplets with a diameter of about 2.5% micrometers or less. That's what they are saying. In fact, when you look at this other part of the, the graph, they're talking about areas where this is happening, right? So I, I'll tell you, Medina and some other areas, they, 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 they mention it. We'll get the details. Stay with us because the Environmental Protection Agency is joining us. The Ghana Meteorological Agency is joining us to talk about this because it's about you and I, the air we are breathing. And what you thought was Hamatan is not just a change in weather, but the polluted air that we're breathing. So we get an interpretation, but we've just got some worrying news earlier today, some just three hours ago, of another earthquake in Turkey. So we want to establish, yeah, what, that's what you see on the screen there. This is a video that, that popped out not too long ago. Um, so you see it, just about 8 p.m. Turkey time. They are two hours ahead of us, right? So it's over, uh, beyond midnight now, as we speak. But this is what happened, right? And you would shortly see the impact of the earthquake. This is what happened. Uh, this would say this two hours to three hours. Yes, that's what you see there. Um, so this video was taken when the, the earthquake occurred just about some three to four hours ago. So let's do this quickly. Yeah, let's let's go to Turkey right now. Let's let's go to Turkey right now, shall we? Um, Dr. Mubarak Mubik is a leader of the Ghanaian community in Ankara, Turkey. He is joining us on Zoom right now. Doc, thank you. Thank you so much for staying up 
I know it's really, really late where you are. Um, tell us what, what you know so far or what the Turkish media has been reporting about the, the earthquake that occurred some few hours ago. Yes, uh, uh, good evening to all of you and uh, your viewers. Uh, we, unfortunately, the same area where the earthquake was experienced, I think about uh, two weeks approximately, yeah, two weeks ago, yeah, exactly two weeks ago, Hatay, where our brother Chris Anachu, you know, unfortunately lost his life, the same city. Yes, uh, at about 8.4, there about p.m. in the evening. Uh, I mean, in Ghana, it is still today, but here we will say yesterday because it is past 12 o'clock here now. <laughs> so around 8.4, there was 6.4 earthquake magnitude, you know, earthquake. And uh, three minutes later, actually, it was also a twin earthquake. Three minutes later, there was also 5.8 earthquake, uh, the same area, the same city, but, uh, you know, uh, two different locations. Uh, uh, and so far, 213 people have been injured. And don't forget that actually the rescue operation today had finished in all other, uh, in all the other areas that were affected by the, earth, by the earlier earthquake except for these two cities you know hatai and uh, another city called karamamaraj so rescue workers were still there doing their work we still have buildings that are you know in a very poor condition just about to fall and all of that yeah so i do not have details on the condition under which the people were injured but 213 people have been injured and uh, three people have lost their lives and uh, i understand Two people are trapped, and uh, the rescue workers are doing their best to to rescue them as we speak right now. Yeah, I, so I, I see. it was also a twin earthquake, you know, 6.4, and then three minutes later, we had a 5.8 magnitude. All happening in the same city, Hatay, you know, where we lost our brother. I, I, I uh, see. Christian Nacho, sadly. Wow, yeah. so, so we're talking about two earthquakes, 6.4, and from what you're saying, 5.8, all happening concurrently in this same area. But can you tell us the extent of, of devastation as we speak from what you have monitored on the report so far? So already the buildings there have been affected by the earlier earthquake. Uh, there is no report as we speak right now, but of course, Three human lives have been lost okay. uh, by the earthquake, by the recent, by the latest strike. Uh, three people have lost their lives. 213 people so far uh, are injured and have been taken to the hospital. And uh, two people uh, are right now trapped and the rescuers are trying to, to rescue them as we speak now, yeah. That's quite, quite sad, really. But are you able to tell us if you know of whether Ghanaians were living in these two other cities who have not, we understand from what you're saying, have been hit by these latest earthquakes? Uh, luckily enough for us, we don't have Ghanaians right now. You know, the city of Hatay, frankly, a lot of, of almost all the persons that have been evacuated, uh, I mean, not Ghanaians, you know, almost the Turkish and all of that, because the city is, is is terribly affected by the you know earlier earthquake so uh, the houses and all of that people are told not to go there yes yeah, so in the city of hatai thankfully we don't have any Ghanaian right now as we speak but there are nearby cities like adana right i have received calls from some Ghanaian students uh, i think about seven of them uh, they also experienced the aftershocks of this uh, latest strike and of course, as you can imagine, psychologically, they are a bit traumatized and uh, they, they want to go home. Okay, they called me if uh, there's any arrangement that can be put in place to move them from that place. So I have tried to reach the 
the embassy, but you know, it's late. The deputy ambassador is late here. True. Uh, and so I've sent him a message. Hopefully, morning he will get back to me because the ambassador herself I understand she went to the body of uh, Chris Anachu to Ghana. Uh, right. So he is here acting uh, in the absence. So I've sent him the message. Uh, I am sure early morning he'll get back to me. I've asked them to compile the list and send to me, and then we'll see what we'll do, uh, you know, when the day breaks, yeah. But they are safe, except that, of course, they are they are traumatized, they are scared, because they don't know what will happen. They are not in the affected area, but they experience the aftershock, yeah. I, I see. And um, for the Ghanaians, um, you're talking about... Some of them now, the students, you're making preparations to evacuate them. But those who were evacuated earlier, how are they doing? Um, they were sent to you in Ankara and other places. They are doing fine. They are doing fine. Uh, they are here in Ankara, like I said, and those in Istanbul. They have settled. Uh, there's no problem. Even tomorrow, uh, we'll be meeting with some of them. You know, one of them only reported of experiencing some sore throat this is normal because the weather is very cold and considering that they had to stay in the cold over there uh, for a couple of days because of the, the earthquake and all of that yeah it's a normal effect of of, of the situation they experience uh, in those unfortunate times so yeah tomorrow uh, we will attend to him i've told him we'll, we'll make arrangement to take him to the nearby health facility to be attended to and then all of that Apart from that, they are all fine. There's, there's no problem. Everything is, is, is okay. Of course, uh, we continue to give them counseling because, you know, uh, the trauma still stays, you know. Uh, some of them complain that when they are sitting, they feel like the earth is shaking, even though it's not shaking. I mean, these are normal uh, after effects, you know, of the traumatic uh, experience that they have gone through. So... We continue to counsel them and uh, give them the necessary social support they need to to navigate through this this difficult time. Yeah, I mean, but they uh, are fine. Dr. Yeah. finally, and this is coming at a time when we're all processing the news of the death of Christian Achu, uh, and you are there, and I'm sure this must be difficult for you. I mean, coming to terms with two earthquakes in one night. Yes, 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 yes. Obviously difficult, very difficult, you know. Uh, and I can understand the students also in Adana because the earlier earthquake, they also experienced the, you know, so, and because they are a bit closer to, you know, close to the epicenter, so they experienced the aftershock to move them at the time, but they took that, that, that okay. The, the, the students said they were fine. You know, they wanted to stay in their hostel. Uh, there was there was no problem. There. Nothing has been, you know, their hostel hasn't been affected. The school is okay. So they just experienced the aftershock. So you know, so when they said that we problem, then. The, but now, uh, with these two other strikes, <laughs> to, they, they, are, they are calling for help. They, they want to leave the place at least uh, to a place where they can have some 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 uh, stability in their lives for some time. You know, right? Yeah, until the situation returns to normal. Yeah. So it's difficult for all of us. You know? I, I, I can imagine. Just when you think you are done with. Uh, the earlier one, one earlier one <laughs> this one also comes and you have to deal with other challenges already we are dealing with those here in in, in ankara you know uh, trying to help them get back to normal uh, and then with this one also coming obviously uh, is is stressful but we'll go through it yeah. indeed indeed and um we want to wish you well on, on this and um our best wishes Dr. Mohamed Mubarak, thank you. Thank you so much for staying up and talking to us um, uh, from, from Turkey. Dr. Mohamed Mubarak is a leader of the Ghanaian community in Ankara in Turkey. The news we have just uh, received, two earthquakes 
in Turkey. We understand 6.4, 5.8 magnitude. Three people confirmed dead. A little over 200 people injured. We understand two people have been trapped as well. The fortunate news, well, is that no Ghanaian is involved in this. They have all been evacuated. But we have eyes on this. Stay with us. We will be back shortly after this quick break on Ghana Tonight. There's more to come. Stay with us. Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. We are live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279 as always, all across the world on 3news.com. Now, tension is brewing in some parts of the northeast region as some Irish youth hit the streets to protest attempts by the military to arrest a rival Boko Na Alhaji Seydou Abagri, who was recently unskinned by the Nairi Na Abdullahi Mahami Shariga. Now, the youth in Walewale and Nalerugu, from, that's what you see on the screen there, they blocked various entry points into the town, so burning lorry ties, that's what you see on the screen right now, uh, to register their displeasure. And they also, from the reports we monitored, vandalized the NPP office in the area. And the, the tires that were burnt and roads that were blocked is what you see there on, on the screen. And that's quite worrying the developments as we have it. And this is something that we understand that has generated some concern, especially among the watchers of the space and what's happening, especially with the issues relating to the right interventions. Bear in mind, about a week ago, just about last, sometime last week, Wednesday, the government issued a statement signed by Kojo Ponkrumah directing the security agency there in the area to arrest anyone who introduces himself or puts himself up as the newly unskinned Bokona. Let's go on to Zoom now. And uh, Dr. Victor Doke is the security consultant and lecturer at the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center. Dr. Doke, thank you so much for joining us. Also, uh, we have a sociologist, uh, Dr. Ebenezer Ayensu. He's a historian. He's a head of department, general studies, Heritage Christian College, and Masman. But until recently, he was a senior research fellow at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, Legon. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time on Ghana tonight. Let me start off with you, uh, Dr. Doke. From the security perspective, things, a lot has happened today. What's your own assessment of the reports you've been, we've been picking about the reaction of the youth in Narelugu to what they suspected was an attempt by the military to arrest the person whom they had reportedly skinned as Bokuna? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the event, uh, the 15th February event has um, changed the dynamics with regards to the chief sensei conflict in Boko. Now, my assessment with regards to the security situation is, uh, now, first of all, it's um, getting worse in a sense that um, the military wanting to effect the arrest and the youth having to stop the military stems uh, or makes it um, very serious. Now, we all know the state and its agencies, which the military is one, has the authority to effect the mandate with regards to arrest and the youth having their line of action, uh, be the protest or basically denying access for these military men to effect the arrest has changed the conflict dynamically. And if care is not taken, we're going to have a situation where we have the youth versus the military in uh, armed combat, which we do not want to. So we have to take precaution. Uh, in an event where the state through the military insists on effecting the arrest, we could use what we call the mediator. Now, a neutral mediator to come in between so that the, that the military will not be directly linked to uh, making arrests or so forth. But a mediator would have to come in to calm the nerves of these youths. Then we can find a way forward. I see. But this neutral mediator that you talk about, who, who fits that status that you're recommending? 
Because in times past, we've seen uh, the clergy, we've seen traditional leaders, eminent persons in society, all taking up this neutral arbiter or mediator position that you're talking about. In fact, in, in other areas, as Antonio Tufo said, to at a point as well, who, in your estimation, fits this neutral mediator status? Well, we could have, as you rightly mentioned, the, for example, the Asantini coming in. And we know his role in the Dagon crisis. Now, with this particular mediator, it has to be very neutral. One that the parties uphold and regard in high esteem, it could be from the civil society organizations or prominent, eminent persons. And in conflict resolution, we call them the track actors. They fall into the track one actors, and then the CS will fall into the track two actors. So we need to have a very prominent person or um, organization leading the forefront of mediations where this person will be regarded and lead mediations. Otherwise, we'll get nowhere. Uh, Dr. Okay, hold on a bit for me, and uh, let me bring you in here as well, uh, Dr. Ibenezer Ayen. So, I mean, there's been a number of interventions to try and deal with this Boko situation, but from the sociological perspective, what's your assessment of the interventions to address this rather escalating situation in Boko? Okay, thank you very much. In my opinion, I think uh, we've not, uh, the stakeholders have not brought in uh, the element of parallels in the sense that what is, uh, what triggered the confusion in Boku uh, was in existence in other pre-colonial areas. I cited uh, a number of times, cited my own area in a crapping where until the 1730s, the need to get a second uh, group to help beat off Akwamu emerged. Eventually, the, the Guan community looked to their neighbors at Achimabwakwa. They came down and that problem was solved. At the end of the day, the Achim, uh, we called them liberators, the Guan community, and then those who are wrongly referred to as Akwamu remnants, resolve, resolve and evolve an institution, the chieftain's institution, that gave birth to a, a Kwapim state as it is now. Yes, in between time, these people, the Kwapim Gwangs, have been fighting at Chimabuakwa. But at the end of the day, peace is restored. The recent one was the 1994 conflict. And I believe if we use traditional dispute resolution methods, we can solve this. The area, the Mampusi and the Kusasi have been in existence, have lived together for a very long time. Obviously, intermarriages are taking place. And as uh, the gentleman who spoke ahead of me indicated, we can get eminent people from this, the products of those intermarriages, to play a leading role to resolve their problem. Beside using the example that I've cited, that where we have similar we have had similar situations, we could use the methods they use to settle the, the, the conflicts. But we've seen, for instance, these traditional leaders, eminent persons roped in uh, over the period in looking for the solution or the right mediation intervention in solving this. So if we have to go on the same path, how should the traditional leaders or these eminent persons approach the new dynamics of this you know, buckle situation that we're seeing? I believe they should look out for, as I've indicated already, products of, from the intermarriages. And, and then we have those from both sides who want peace to prevail. They have to be identified. And then they've had friends. I mean, people who have gone there to work with, who have lived with them for a very long time. And there are some non-indigenous, Mampusi or Kusasi, 
living in Boko, who are on good terms with both parties. They could also use them. Use them. Okay, so let me ask you this. I mean, from the some security analysts earlier raised concerns about the government's directive, Dr. Doke, to the security to arrest anyone who holds himself as the new Bokona. That was in a statement that Kojo Ponkoma signed sometime last Wednesday. So the, the youth were already on edge to prevent this from, from happening. So from your own analysis, what exactly could have been done differently instead of, in this statement, directing the security to arrest anybody, which obviously got the youth alert today? Well, if we say we would want to fault the government, we, look, we have to look at it in, in, in two ways. Now, first of all, did they receive intel that there was going to be an escape in? And if they did, what happened to the final stages of the intel? For them not to take the active responses, but the active the, the, the reaction was a bit late than we all expected. Because if they had gotten their intel earlier on, then they would have acted in response and stopped the event. Now, I would not say I fought them entirely, but the aspect where intel has to be given appropriately and speedily for for the actions to be taken. We need to look at how quick Intel has to get to these appropriate agencies for them to act within their time frame and then prevent any kind of clashes between Kusasi and Mamputi. I see, but how can government prove its, its neutrality uh, and, and become that neutral element in, in this? Because already, as you have indicated, government is being blamed or fingers are being pointed at government for taking sides in this latest development. It's very true. Um, from the two sides, so they, are, they, are, they are suspecting bias from the side of the government. Now, how the government can play out a neutral position is to let its agency, the National Peace Council, take the forefront. At least the National Peace Council has gained some prominence when it comes to this conflict. Now, the government needs to resource the National Peace Council so that the National Peace Council can take its full responsibility. The goal for which it was established in line with conflict resolution and conflict prevention. In that way, the government will just have to sit back and direct activities, taking uh, reports and then suggest ways. But letting the National Peace Council take a very focal point and lead role is very essential. Otherwise, We'll have a situation whereby the National Peace Council will always come in late and they will get nowhere because they will not have to, they, they wouldn't be in a, uh, in a position to be abreast with the current situations on the ground. And we will ensure, we have to ensure that when the National Peace Council comes in, then we can have the CSOs also given technical guidance, capacity building to the National Peace Council. Then it will now relate to the local community representative as a BIPC, the Boku Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee, together we have these stakeholders. We can now have a neutral mediator come in, sit down with all these stakeholders, and we can get somewhere. With the sustained engagement, then mediations can now roll out. I see. Dr. Ayesu, so this, the proposal for this neutral arbiter um, to, to step in, how then do you marry that with the sociological approach to finding the right intervention to dealing with this problem? Yes, I think I agree with my colleague. And um, the first step, we should go back to history. During the uh, era of the late Kutua Champong, he made sure that the upper region, the regional commissioner at least, was not an indigent from the region. So talking now, he was talking about Intel. If the assemblies, the, the MCs, DCs there are not from the area. The possibility of getting the signals and uh, directing the signals directly to government will be there. But if they are from there, they might be 
in a way tainted by way of their connection, ethnic connection, friendship, and whatever. Having said that, um, obviously there will be um, the need, there's a need for someone to play the role that my friend had suggested. And I strongly believe that um, some attempt should be made to get eminent citizens from the area to work hand in hand strongly with the National Peace Council. Of course, government will relax, will be at the background to provide the necessary logistics and whatever. And then we shouldn't also forget that in all this, there are people who are not, who are from the area, but hardly go there. They provide admission. Who encourage the youth to do what they are doing right now? Now, this is what the government, the statement is. And believe you me, most of the, this youth will not even understand the statement issue. There was, or there are some people who interpreted, or let me put it, misinterpreted the instructions and then incited them. The money they used to buy whatever they are, they are using to block and whatever. Where did this come from? So these people should also be looked for. And they are in Accra. They are in the big cities. And then not looking for them to arrest them, but looking for them to for them to be conscientized that what you people are doing every now and then, what who is in the news, are you not ashamed of it? Mm. This must be made known to them. They are there, they are in Accra. Accra in the big cities. They provide their missions and everything. And at the end of the day, if government fails to act, they will blame government. Government bl uh, acts, and then I hear both sides are blaming government. So who is who? And who is doing what? Dr. Ebenezer Yesu, thank you uh, for your time. In fact, we've been showing videos of what's been happening today in Boko with the, the, some of the property that have been destroyed. Dr. Ebenezer Ayensu, thank you so much. Uh, is a historian, he's a head of, head of department, general studies, Heritage Christian College, and Masaman, until recently, senior research fellow at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, Lagon. Thank you for your analysis of this from the historical perspective and also how the sociological approach can help in addressing the happenings in Boko. But talk about pollution. We're dealing with not only water pollution but also air pollution now as many of you have seen and a lot of you have shown symptoms of some respiratory infections and there's also according to the Ghana Med Medical Association we have reported cases of increased cough as well and but the QS air visual a real-time air quality information platform is saying that Ghana's air quality is currently 49.6 times the World Health Organization's annual air quality guideline value. And we'll put that on the screen shortly. Now, this decide attributes to the high concentration of the levels of pollution. Now, from what we're gathering, they've seen particles such as dust, soothe, dirt, smoke, and liquid droplets with a diameter of 2.5 micrometers or less. It is actually believed that the high concentration of these elements in the air has been compounded by the resurgence of the Hamatan as a result of regional dust storms pushing into southern Ghana. Now, we'll have the Environmental Protection Agency giving us a quick, quick, quick analysis of what they have actually picked up so far. But Felicity Ahafianyo is a chief forecaster at the Ghana Meteorological Agency. She's joining us on Zoom. Felicity, thank you so much for joining us on Ghana tonight. First of all, what's the Ghana Medical, that's the Meteorological Agency's association, that's your own analysis of this particular development in especially Accra, the atmosphere and the concentration of these pollution particles. Thank you very much. Um, for 
our Hamatan season over the West African sub-region uh, not from November and ends in February, and at times it extends into the early part of March. Um, we have it in variations in terms of intensity, so every year comes with differences. Um, so every year it starts in February, uh, November and ends in March most of the time. But the difference that we are having is that when it gets to when it gets to the 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 coastal belt, that is where we have a little bit of a, a challenge. Uh, where it's not too visible because of the fluctuations that uh, happens in the in the characteristics or the features that comes with it. Um, we normally have a moisture influx that normally comes towards the ending of uh, January and then February, where where we get cloudy situations and possible showers. Uh, this year we had the rain in January. We had some rain also in February before we are having another. Uh, best of the Hamatam uh, season over the entire West African sub region. So, for Hamatam season, it's normal, but when it comes to the impact that we are getting along the coast, uh, it's not too normal. We are having some abnormalities in it. I'm saying this in the sense that uh, we have, um, I think, a uh, 2004 or so, we had a similar situation where we have Hamatan fully in uh, February along over the entire country where Greater Accra, Central, Western, and part of Water region were all affected massively, like what we are having. But I currently have, uh, have access to the data where we can compare. So we are still researching into it to know whether this one is more uh, intense than the 2004 one. What a worrying development. In fact, let's stay a bit further on this, go on to the telephone. And Felicity, I'll come to you because we have, we have at least some data that was put out earlier today, which we've been showing to our viewers. Let's go on to uh, the telephone now. And uh, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Dr. Henry Kwabena Kokofu, is also joining us on the telephone Dr. Kokovo, thank you for your time on Ghana tonight. Now, you, ha have you have you seen the details of this report uh, that indicates that we our air is unhealthy and we have dust, soot, dirt, smoke, and liquid droplets at high density in the air that we are breathing. Yes, I'm aware. I'm fully aware, and for that matter, Environmental Protection Agency, we are aware. Okay. Um, we had a call to call the media uh, for an interaction and uh, try to disseminate the information to the public. Uh, we did so by uh, calling on sister institutions, I mean, relevant to the issue at stake. And here, um, I'm, I'm okay to mention Ghana Health Service. Uh, representative, and then also a representative from the Ghana Meteorological Authority. They were with us at uh, EPA uh, to address the press and to enumerate and explain, and then answer two questions that uh, participants uh, put to us. Yeah. I see. What are the specific measures that you are adopting in response to the details of this report? Well, before we put up uh, or we put forward any uh, measures, mitigating measures, it was important to situate uh, uh, the causes, the drivers of this situation. Uh, you may recall that uh, run up to the 20. 22 Christmas festivities, somewhere late in November. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency had a cause to call for media interactions. And Uh, 
Authorities uh, explain as a natural phenomenon, or if you like, force majeure. That is uh, the blowing of um, a sand storm mm -hmm. over the Sahel or the Sahai, uh, Sahara region right. uh, across uh, the nation, uh, with the northern sector of the nation and the transition zone being the heavily affected areas. We at the down south are also experiencing what we are seeing today. So, beside the natural phenomenon, we do also know that there are practices, human activities that are culminating into uh, or culminating to the pollution of the uh, atmosphere, thereby causing poor quality air for ourselves. And the, the ensuing health implications have been explained to the people. So, the measures that we need to take and adapt to what? Uh, we have got to go back to the wear of the mask. That's the masking up. Uh, it is very, very important uh, at this moment too. Um, more indoor activities must be encouraged and less outdoor activities. Uh, then again, uh, those of us who are uh, heavily vulnerable, I mean those who, who have respiratory diseases like asthma and others, must be on the lookout and must avoid dusty areas, uh, emission areas where smoke and dust get uh, combined. Uh, that, that again, that again uh, will also mean citizens refrain from most of our activities and actions that uh, pollute the air, particularly the indiscriminate burning of uh, materials, including uh, electronic waste, including uh, household uh, food. Uh, uh, Bufu, that's that's, uh, that's yeah. where I was coming to. I mean, we, we've, we know this, the electronic waste pollution and other human activity that has polluted our air or environment for a long time. I mean, this report is only coming to confirm what you, I mean, EPA, you know. So I'm wondering why we did not take these measures you're talking about way before this report comes in to only tell us this detail? Well, when it comes to the management of the air or the atmospheric um, ecosystem, it is not a day's wonder. So we can uh, easily see a systemic failure over a long period of time uh, with these activities going on and then uh, society, and for that matter, regulations uh, are not working. Uh, regulators are somehow a bit um, handicapped. Uh, one, due to uh, uh, citizens' attitude. Two, uh, due to uh, unawareness or, if you like, um, uh, ignorance of uh, what we have on our hands. Let us put it in, in context. The electronic waste situation we had Abu Bluchi, uh being a hub of this uh, pollution uh, uh, enclave. And we all sat through and sat down for over a decade, two, more than three decades, with these okay. activities going on. It was just recently, 2018 coming, right. uh, when the President of the Republic, uh, uh, by his marching orders, right. asked uh, the regional minister and ourselves to get to, to work. And thanks to God, We've been able to eradicate that tanker from the middle of our, our city. And that is a plus, too. We okay. need to consolidate on that game and make sure that we'll, uh, we'll, every we'll deal with this. Uh, cranny, look and cranny, where people are engaging in other forms of uh, burning, including the use of used ties to uh, uh, clean, uh, to, 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 to whatever, roast uh, animals. Right. And then also burning these use sites use for, for wires and all that. Thank you. As regulators, we have been on, on the on the heels of those perpetrators. However, 
right uh, we have so I, I think that point 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 well made and uh look the coming days we'll, we'll, we'll see what what happens but you know exactly what to do epa really um but felicity how long is this weather going to persist from your own forecast climatologically uh, we are expecting it over the southern sector by maximum by middle of march to end and then uh, for those of us over the north, we are expecting it that by March ending into April, it's likely to end over there. But then uh, we are still expecting uh, another outburst. But in terms of the wind direction, consideration is not possible to come down to us over the, the southern sector. But mostly it directs itself towards the European continent. And then um, the American continent around April May into June, uh, but then uh, those over the upper east, the northeast, the upper west, they are likely to still have some traces of dust particles around this time. But for us, uh, gradually we are heading towards the hot season. After after this dust has settled and everything is done and we are okay, then we we'll have another battle to this, which is the high temperatures during the afternoon and then the night time temperatures. So we are monitoring to see whether it's going to be normal or slightly above normal. So the seasonal forecast is working. And we are hoping that by 10th of March, uh, the season, the forecast will be ready where we all know how the rainfall will be, how the temperature region will also be. So thank you very much. She is the chief forecaster at the Ghana Meteorological Agency. Thank you to you as well, Dr. Kwabuna Kokofu, uh, executive director of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. Well, there's uh, a few things that happened today at the vetting of some minister nom nominees. Take a look at this briefly. It's a book. The president announced names of nominees for ministerial appointment. The vetting commenced this morning at 10 o'clock, immediately after this press statement. We in the minority wish to state it clear that we remain committed to ensuring greater scrutiny and will spare no effort to proceed uh, to protect the public purse. In line with this, we are taking part in the vetting processes so that at the very minimum, we can scrutinize the president's decision in the NDC stand united with our number of 136 for this expedition. To lead a day, Dr. Kesela to force in. So the process continues tomorrow. Stay with us and we'll bring you a lot more coverage on it. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company as always. And thank you for staying with us on Ghana tonight. I am Alfred Akonsi. Have a good night.